Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Welcome back to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with me, Carl Fitzpatrick. Bill Ollie is changing the way entrepreneurship is understood, taught and practiced around the world. Bill has over 25 years of business success, first at IBM and then as a three-time entrepreneur. His love for sharing his knowledge and experience has led him to lecturing at the MIT Sloan School of Management in the US and writing a best-selling book on the subject he knows best, entrepreneurship. Bill Ole, Managing Director, Professor and Author, what makes a great entrepreneur? Well, first of all, you have to, be, uh, you have, to have a vision. You have to be able to see something, um, a world that doesn't exist today, and then you have to be able to make that happen. And, and to do that, you, you have to be a not just a leader of a, a visionary, but you have to execute. You have to be willing to be different. So we always talk about a great entrepreneur has the spirit of a pirate willing to be different, but the execution skills of a Navy SEAL. Right. So what have been the standout examples of great entrepreneurship for you in recent years? Ah, there's a great one out of Ireland named Patrick Collison, who was from MIT, who started Stripe. Um, you know, and then we also have some of our other students, Freddie Karras, who started a company called Octa, which just went public on the uh, stock exchange in the United States. And another one is the fastest growing company here in the United States called PillPack. And all of them exhibit this willingness to, to take on the established order and change it and do so with great execution skills and fearless, fearless mindset. And from the nature versus nurture perspective, are all entrepreneurs born with these qualities or is it possible to learn and develop these traits? So it's, uh, this is what I used to believe and now I, I understand seeing the data and seeing examples every day. It's rubbish that entrepreneurs are born. There's no gene for an entrepreneurship. Um, it, it's a skill, it's a craft that you can develop um, that anybody can do it. And often it's by necessity that people do it. But it's not a science in the aspect that, you know, you have to, um, you know, it's deterministic that if you do X and you do Y, you get Z. Um, it's rather something that if their first principles, if you do them right, your odds of success go up. But on the other hand, it's not an art where very few people can do it and it's ambiguous. So you can absolutely learn it. We see it every day. Um, it is, the, the other misconception is it's an individual sport. It's not an individual sport, it's a team sport. So if you don't have certain skills, you get those skills with other people on your team. Now, as I mentioned, you are a best-selling author, having published Disciplined Entrepreneurship back in 2013. The book has become best known for identifying your 24 steps to creating a successful startup. But how and why did you develop this model? You know, it's interesting. I didn't set out to write a book, Carl. I, I, I just wanted, I had to teach a class here. And I went out and tried to find a book that pulled together the many different parts of entrepreneurship in a coherent way that I, as a practitioner over 20 plus years, had experienced. And I was shocked to find that there was no one, there was no one book. There was a little here, there was a little there. And so I created a reader for the class, pulling different pieces from areas. And then as I started doing that, I started writing the connective tissue between these different pieces. And, um, and then that became a, a kind of a bootleg reader. And um, Wiley approached me and said, hey, would you like to publish this? And I said, sure, if anybody else would find it useful. So it's, um, it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done to see all these people who are now entrepreneurs because of it. So if any of our listeners this morning have an idea for a new business, what should they do to get it off to a good start? Well, I wrote this article uh, called The Most Overrated Thing in Entrepreneurship. And the most overrated thing in entrepreneurship is the idea. Everybody thinks so it's all about the idea. Yeah, you need an idea to get started, but it is so much more about figuring out who the customer is and, and, and direct, directing your focus on what can you do for that customer and having a disciplined process to go through it. And then the most important thing is um, a, a, the team. You ha- have, a go- have a good, solid team where they have complementary skills, and but you give each other energy. Again, I use the sports analogy. You, you have to get you know, a good goalie. You have to get someone who's good on defense. You have to get someone who's good at scoring goals on offense. And so you build that team. So um, if you have an idea, that's just the beginning. You have to go out. You have to learn about entrepreneurship. You have to figure out who your customers. You have to build your team. 
And of course, Jim Collins in his book From Good to Great talks about getting the right people on the bus before you set off on your journey. Would you agree with that? Yes, and, and I, 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 I love that analogy. But I would say in entrepreneurship, you can't just get the people to get on a bus that has an undetermined location. In entrepreneurship, it's critical to have people who have a passion for your general vision. So you have to have a bus and you have to say, this bus is going into the area of clean energy or it's going into education or it's going over here. And here's a general idea. And then get the right people on the bus for that journey. Now, in your book, you speak of the beachhead market and the total addressable market size. What are these markets and how can they be identified and calculated? So, first of all, you know, one of the things is, uh, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not that smart. Um, I just made all the mistakes in the world. And I tried, I figured if I had three or four markets, that was better than having one market. And, I, and if somehow that didn't work. And then the more I focused, the more progress I made. And then as I started to look around, I saw great analogies for this. Um, there's a, a, you know, military, you know, they have this concept of a beachhead market. You don't try to attack the, all, on all sides your enemy. You attack in one place like they did in World War II. You went to Normandy, and then you came up. And so the military have known this. And then I saw a great uh, proverb from a Romanian friend that said, you know, a person who tries to catch two rabbits catches none. You have to focus on catching one, and that one beachhead market, you have to make sure it's significant enough. And so you figure out how many users there are in that beachhead market and how much they will spend, how much are they worth to you. And that becomes the total addressable market size for your beachhead market. And this focus is critical for an entrepreneur. Now, if you've just tuned in, we're examining the process involved in creating successful startups with Entrepreneur Supremo. Bill Ole. Bill, we've looked at markets, but what else can a business owner do to define the customer for the product or service? That is the critical question. You know, not only do you have to identify the customer, you have to walk in their shoes, Carl. You have to almost become one with the customer. And this is what we call primary market research. And this is one of the things I did when I was at MIT getting my graduate degree is I studied companies and I found out the ones that were really the great companies were the ones who who really understood their customer, not just economically, but socially, emotionally, you know, in all dimensions. They had walked miles in their shoes, and then they developed the right products for them, and they messaged it, and they had them go through the right channels and with the right um, business models to, to get paid for. So understanding and being very specific about your customer and who is not your customer is critically important for any, uh, any business especially an entrepreneur who has limited resources and time. We've created the perfect customer profile, but now we need to analyse what can we do for the customer. What steps should we follow to successfully identify this, Bill? Yeah, well, this is what what, what people refer to as the quantified value proposition. How do I know what I'm doing for my customer? And, you know, and and, and I heard this term and I had a hard time with it because I'm an engineer and I, you know, the first rule of engineering is to find your terms. What do we mean by that? And as, as I thought about it a lot more, I realized you have to understand what your customer's number one priority is. Is it cost? Is it time to market? Is it, you know, um, is it reliability? What is it? And if that, then you have to say it could be, um, you know, comfort level. Whatever that is, you need to say what is the as-is state for what they're doing and then what is the possible state in that dimension for that factor and that's how you determine what your quantified value propositions you're doing for your customer. And if you do it right, uh, you'll see the customer's eyes just light up as you give it to them. And staying with the customer mindset, what are the important factors to be considered in terms of how our customers will be best able to acquire or access our product or service? Yeah, this is another part that, that, that you know, I, I couldn't find integrated in. And yet there's a lot of there's been a lot of work out there on this. And uh, it's called the decision-making unit. When people say a customer, um, that's a bit of an amorphous term. Do they mean the end user, the person who uses the product, and when they use it, it creates value? Or do they mean the economic buyer, the person who pays for it? Or do they mean the champion of the person who champions getting your product or offering? All three of those could be the same person, but very often they're not. And understanding each one of those roles and who influences them is critically important. And so, you know, you may have a great product, but the best product doesn't always win. It's the product that's used by the customer that creates value that 
that the, the, the customer recognizes. And to do that, we have to understand the acquisition process. And that's understanding what we, I just overview as the decision-making unit and then understanding that's who makes the decision and then the decision-making process is how they make it. Now, the part that we're all interested in, making money from the product or service offering, what steps would you ask business owners to follow to ensure that they are maximizing their commercial returns? Yeah, and that's a really interesting question because often people just say, oh, I, I, I can make a widget and I can sell it for $10 and it only cost me $1 to make, and therefore I'm making money. That is a very naive, and, and I understand it because I did it as well. I did it as well. Um, that's it, naive because the biggest cost that's usually incurred in these is the marketing and sales cost. So what we do is in ours in the disciplined approach is we say, what is, you know, who is the customer? And then how much is that customer worth to you in profit? And that's one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, we figure out how much does it cost to acquire a new customer? Now they'll vary, but what's the average cost to acquire a customer? And compare that to the lifetime value of that customer from a profitability standpoint. And this is what we call unit economics. And it's a very simple concept, and it's something that you can start to get your head around. And that's how you tell whether you're going to make money on the pro- and if you, at, at a product level. And if you're not going to make money at that, then you have to fix it or abandon the business. And you'd be shocked at how many businesses don't understand that fundamentals. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to make business your money's going to make business. But that says, yes, we have cleared the first hurdle. Then we have to look at, will, will that profit cover the research and development overhead costs that we are going to incur as well? But it's a, a, a systematic approach that we're taking to make sure that your business is economically viable. So let's focus on the product next. How do great entrepreneurs set about building a product? Uh, first of all, great entrepreneurs are cheap. Uh, they, they, they don't spend money on things that they don't see a, a good return on. Um, and, and, and I use that term and people, oh, you're cheap, that's not right. I, by cheap, I don't mean saying no. Any, any monkey can say no to anything. It's, it's the smart person who figures out what they spend their money on where they get a real re- reward from it. So people who are great developers figure out what are the key assumptions that I need to test that if they're true, then my product will be successful. And then they find the most economic ways to test those with customers, not just asking them, but then doing what's called A-B testing and then getting, getting behavioral economic studies to show that, in fact, they're going to do what you want them to do. And then that proves the hypothesis or disproves it. And then you go about building it. There's this urge to build stuff very, very quickly. And there's a lot of problems with that. A, it's, it's expensive from a monetary standpoint. It's much less expensive than it's previously been, but it's also expensive in that people get emotionally attached to what they built. This is called the IKEA effect. I talk about this in the book, and it's, it's just, it, it makes it hard for people to really listen to the customer the way they should. And Bill, it's every business owner's dream to achieve scalability, but how is this best realized? Well, first of all, you have to think about what is it that you do that's unique? What's your unique, your special sauce? This is what we refer to as the core. And so if they're going to achieve scalability, they can't just say, oh, here comes someone in and I'm doing something for them, and they're happy and they leave. They, have to, they can't be playing checkers. They have to be playing chess. They have to think, what can I do that will, will, will make not only this customer happy, but many other customers after that, beyond Donegal, beyond Cork, even into the place like United States, and that, then you have a scalable business. And this is what we call the core. It's steps 10 and 11 of, of the uh, discipline of entrepreneurship approach. Now, in October of last year, you made the headlines for saying that you believe that Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook fame is not a good example for startups. What has brought you to this conclusion? Well, there's nothing against Mark Zuckerberg, um, but, but the, he is not a typical, he's a statistical outlier for entrepreneurs. Um, entrepreneurs are not usually 20 years old. And they don't usually try something, and then all of a sudden it takes off and they're in the movies. Most entrepreneurs are in their 30s, or, or, and they've tried one or more companies before that, and they've learned from that like I did. It's like pancakes. You try something, you try it again. And this idea that, you know, material individualist who just, you know, takes off, that's, that's not a good one. And is it a case that startups are not a young person's game? 
Absolutely not. I mean, there's a lot of myths about entrepreneurship that the material individual is not true. It's a team sport. That it's for young people, not true. Uh, most successful entrepreneurs are in their 30s, and, and but you can start earlier. But usually, there's someone on the team who handles that very difficult aspect called managing humans. And usually, you have to be more mature than a young person to do that. So on the team, the team sport, you usually have people who have more experience than just being a young person. But, the, but, you know, you also have to have a young person's look at the world. You have to be willing to, if all the fish are swimming one way, you have to be willing to swim the other way. You have to be willing to think differently. And, Bill, on the topic of managing people, what advice have you got for business people in that respect? Well, uh, I wrote an article that's become one of the most popular things I've ever written called Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast, quoting an old Peter Drucker line, and it's a, a tech crunch. And I talk about the importance of being a, a, a clear ethical leader because in a startup, you're essentially starting a cult. And I know that's a word that has a lot of negative connotation. But you need to get people to follow. You need to get people to trust you. And if you're an ethical leader, then you're going to put, put out what your values are. And then people may or may not like those. But if they like those and they follow you, then you have a very coherent organization. And when you can trust the person on your left and trust the person on your right, you can achieve extraordinary things. And Bill, final question for you this morning. One commonality between all businesses is business owners are constantly having to overcome problems. What advice do you have for them in terms of how to overcome these problems? That's great. This is, we have a lecture in one of our classes that's called the Stuff Happens Lecture. And we halfway through the semester, they're building a company. And we have a break and we say, look, all this stuff has happened right down what's happened, gone wrong. And, and then I go through them, I put them up there, and we go, what, you know, what other things go wrong? And I say, what, and uh, make a list of them. I say, what do you think the number one thing that goes wrong is? And, um, and then I write on the board in big letter, and they all guess, money, you run out of money, the team, not having a vision, custody. I say, all those, but not the number one. And I said, the number one thing is, at the end, I, big letters, I write everything. Everything is going to go wrong. Even things that you don't even think of, know about, they're going to go wrong, as you said. The question isn't, yeah, they're going to go wrong. You can't stop that. The question is, what do you do when they go wrong? Do you, do you have the mentality? Do you have that, the strength to say, not only am I not going to be defeated by this, this is, going, this is an opportunity. It will make us stronger. And that concept is a concept we call anti-fragility. Not only do you not break, you don't just you with, with weather the storm. You get stronger during the storm. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.